Hello, 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 hello. Hello, can you hear me now? Good. Hey guys, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, we're really happy to have you here. My name's Tim. I'm here on behalf of Linum Labs. We've been we've been having uh, meetups here for the last year. And uh, there's a very special event coming up for you tonight. Uh, we're here with Ambrosius, with the uh, yeah, Ambrosius guys. We uh, and it's the first time that it's their full team that's all coming here together with us. And it's going to be uh, streamed online on the YouTube channel. And now I'm going to pass on the word to Angel. And uh, there's pizza going to be here later on, and free beer if you want some in the fridge over there. So enjoy the event and have a nice time. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks so much for. Uh, can people hear everything? Okay, excellent. Um, if you can double check that the online people can hear everything. Um, so thanks for coming to listen about Ambrosus and uh, we will actually have quite a few updates um, about what we do. And uh, I also thank a lot everybody who's connected to us through online video streaming. Um, you can actually maybe post to Kate what countries you're connected from and Kate could actually announce it. Uh, from what parts of the world are people now connected. So I very much appreciate that our community is so active in following our updates and uh, very much appreciate the, uh, the core supporters of Ambrosos. You know who you are. Um, so I'm just going to begin with a basic uh, introduction to Ambrosos given that. Uh, how many of you have never heard about Ambrosos before? So almost everybody here. So I'm going to make a general introduction to Ambrosos and what we do. And uh, so where, what countries do we have? So Mozambique, uh, Canada, Switzerland, Serbia, France, Sweden, Italy, the UK, Belgium. The UK, Belgium, we're going to be there in the next few days, so you can have a chance to meet us uh, next week. Oh, Chile. Chile. Wow, really all over the world. So uh, thanks a lot, guys, for being with us and for all those to whom it's too early or too late. So Ambrosos is all about assuring uh, product trust. So we actually are a solution to assure quality, safety, and origins of products. Uh, we are concerned about the main problems of the supply chains, specifically of food and pharma. The basic questions are, um, where does the product come from, uh, whether it's authentic or not, and what the quality parameters are. What's going on here? I think it's fine? Okay. Okay, so um, we actually use um, the blockchain technologies to solve the basic issues of trust with products. So whether it's the product's origins or the quality assurance uh, elements, and we actually create opportunities to uh, trust the data about the product. So we combine uh, different techniques. We combine uh, data storage and uh, sensors to actually provide you the information about the product that you are uh, getting. So if you get, if you buy, uh, let's say, a, a, a steak, uh, and it says it's organic, and it says it's from a particular area, you only have the label to trust. And there's been, uh, there have been a number of scandals and a number of um, companies exposed uh, whereby the information on the label was not to be trusted. And there is a lot of manipulation going on in the background. And when things go wrong, you very often cannot find you know, the origin of who was responsible for a particular problem. This is what we solve. So it's, it's a data-centric problem. It's, it's all about, uh, can we trust the data about the product? Uh, and what are the techniques that could allow us to change it? So how do we approach this? We look at different stages of the supply chain, um, beginning with uh, origins of where do the ingredients come from, uh, what goes into the product. Then we record the history of processing, what uh, methods have been used to process the product, uh, whether it actually conforms to the norms, whether that's of uh, healthy aspects or sustainability. And then we follow the product through distribution and location all the way down to the end consumer. So we want to give people the full history of a product's life. And uh, 
our network Ambonet is a platform where these different elements are actually linked to a product. Um, we use smart contracts to just basically not only track the product, but also to automate the process of quality assurance. So at different stages when the product is packed, delivered and received, you have different stages um, also reflected in the smart contract. And uh, this permits quality assurance teams and companies to automate the process. So you no longer have to have uh, a large number of quality assurance managers um, sieving through the data and trying to find when something goes wrong. You no longer have these painful recalls that can actually take weeks to get exposed and weeks or months to have a total recall of products. Uh, this can get automated through, through smart contracts. And this is uh, what Ambrosius is also capable of. And finally, we have uh, innovated on, on our token, and there's going to be a lot more discussion on that down the road. Um, the basic notion of Amber is that it serves as a birth certificate for a product, as well as the history of its life. So everything, so the moment when you create, when you have a product created on the blockchain, you have the so-called asset created on the blockchain, and later on you will see that in, in, in action. So here's just a kind of theoretical of how it works. And then as the product travels through the supply chain, you have different data sets from sensors being recorded to that particular product. So in the end, the token serves as the unique identifier that collects data about the quality of product. So this is also the area where we have innovated on the token side. Uh, we are always, actually today earlier we were and in a workshop with our technical partner Parity, also based in Berlin, to specifically brainstorm you know, the future applications of these data bonded tokens. So nobody in the world has ever done it. So we actually are uh, testing and experimenting with it as, as pioneers in this space. Um, but you will see some interesting results from our uh, past proofs of concepts that we've developed. So this is about Amber. And, and the platform itself, being the backbone for data repository really allows you to create a bunch of different applications or dApps, specifically distributed applications that serve a variety of purposes. These are only some that we've developed with some of our corporate clients or partners. Uh, they include product serialization when you have a factory producing any batch of products, wine, pharmaceuticals, meat, you can produce labels and you also have the database that is distributed so you have the serial numbers that everybody can check and validate on the blockchain. You avoid the double spending problem here by being protected from double printing, for example, of, of these uh, unique identifiers. Uh, we have solutions that we didn't in even initially plan to go into this in the insurance space, but when we started working with uh, food and pharmaceutical companies and they said, well, you work on the supply chain use cases. And when things go right, the person gets you know, a green light, the product is fine. When things go wrong, you know, somebody's gotta pay for it. But what if uh, there is nobody to blame? What if uh, the delivery uh, did not actually satisfy the quality, there was too much humidity or too much heat and the product got damaged, and the driver was not to blame because I was leaving Paris today, the roads were blocked by protesters. So what if there was a truck stuck with medicine, and who is to blame? In that case, you definitely need insurance, and we've been working on some interesting applications in that space, and we're going to announce some first results around June, July. Uh, and some other applications are real-time inventory management. I'm also going to showcase uh, the product itself later on. And additional elements such as loyalty programs, so when a shop sells a healthy food or uh, any product that they want people to buy, they can just use the blockchain to also issue blockchain-based um, uh, loyalty tokens. So from that perspective, we are creating a whole ecosystem around Ambrosos. So the network that we have is a backbone, and on top of that, there are a number of applications. And you will see quite a few of them today uh, in action. Uh, I'll skip, uh, well, I'll briefly go through this part, but importantly, we foster open source innovation. So a lot of this stuff that we produce is uh, released uh, through our GitHub. Uh, we are going to put quite a few things uh, today, so you will have some interesting demonstrations. Uh, we do care about information protection, so we design a solution that will allow public verifiability, whilst at the same time allowing uh, companies to protect the valuable data they have. 
Um, end-to-end -end is an important aspect of what we offer. Uh, there are a number of blockchain projects out there that try to tackle the supply chain case. Indeed, that's been one of the first major use cases of blockchain back in 2011 and 12. So since the early days of Bitcoin, people tried to tackle this problem. However, there were always limitations, uh, whether it's uh, initially lack of smart contracts being available um, or lack of APIs that could connect to sensors. So we believe that now is the right time and we combine the expertise in IoT coupled with blockchain to bring the best of the both worlds to enable us to really create the platform where a blockchain can talk to sensors in a meaningful way. And finally, we try and make tools as developer-friendly as possible, but Vlad, uh, our chief product officer, is going to tell you a lot more about how we approach that aspect, so I won't go too much into that field. So just to demonstrate you the practical aspects of how it works, so imagine you have a stake, for instance, and uh, there is a basic QR code that identifies a product, and you can scan it on your mobile phone, and you see different um, Data, data points pertaining to different stages of the life cycle of the stake, as well as uh, information about its origins. We've been working with a, a quality assurance company to actually uh, develop this uh, use case to the full uh, traceability from the level of cow through to the level of, of uh, carcass in the slaughterhouse, all the way down to the distribution. And we have created um, applications that allow you to interface with the blockchain to record the data from farm to fork. So um, later on you will see this in, in practice, but here's just an example of um, a real certificate for uh, beef, where you have all the basic elements uh, incorporated in a certificate, and this is a very short kind of backend that quality assurance managers can feel. Um, it's very important, you know, it looks quite simple. That's what we also try and do at Ambrosus. To get adoption of our solution or anything else, uh, the user interface needs to be simple. And this is what we've been putting a lot of emphasis on. And um, to, put, to give you a more concrete example, so once you have the premium beef packaged, um, from the previous diagram, you've got the farm with this information. So you've got departure on the 12th of February. Uh, transformation, you have the basic data recorded all the way to production and down to the shop level. Um, these solutions we've built for two companies. Uh, they're currently under NDAs, but they are uh, one, both are fairly large companies. Uh, one of them is about between one and two billion euros in annual revenues, and another one is between two and four billion euros. Um, our goal is to uh, make these partners known uh, within the following few weeks. Um, so once this uh, proof of concept and once this testing has actually been done and deployed, we will uh, release some sort of report on that. But for the time being, we're interested to show you what the basic value proposition is and how it's simple at the front side and at the back side actually it allows you to interface with uh, Ambrose's blockchain. Another example is uh, the supply chain management tools we've built. So um, in this particular case, it's about um, exporting Swiss chocolate. So Switzerland is the uh, world's number one country in terms of uh, brand. Uh, as, as a country brand, it's been selected as the most valuable uh, brand in the world. And basically, Switzerland uh, equals quality for, uh, in many people's minds. So the country itself wants to protect the Swissness, so to say, of their, uh, of their products. In this particular case, it's, it's uh, Swiss chocolate. Um, so we've been looking at you know, the transport routes and um, all the way to China which is a major consumer of, of the Swiss products. And we've also developed an, a solution that allows you to trace uh, the products and uh, actually keep track of their quality. And similar tools have been created for, for coffee that we've also uh, run. Uh, this particular solution we've also built for uh, one of the largest uh, retailers in, in Europe, uh, similarly under NDA, and we're also hoping to uh, make this more public soon, but once again, for you to see the idea of how this works in practice. So this, this is a dashboard similar to the ones that uh, the industry is currently using with one small but fundamental difference. At the back end, it's uh, immutability of data, so the data you can trust. And different stakeholders within the supply chain can uh, actually uh, uh, trace the products and be sure that the quality they're paying for is what they get. 
another application that was built on Ambrosus, that this was one of the earlier applications. We've now actually developed a much more advanced version of that, that we're also testing with a few stakeholders, is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. Uh, the basic notion over there is to permit uh, farmers or uh, retailers, small businesses, to uh, sell their product directly uh, to the consumers and you have quality requirements included. So you don't only have quantity of product and price, you also pay for the quality in the direct meaning of that word. As in, if the sensors detect that the quality is not as promised, the price is immediately dropping. If the quality is no longer acceptable, the money is immediately reimbursed. So this also brings quite a few radical changes to the way people treat quality. It's no longer something that you can just stick under the carpet and uh, ignore. So this is, um, th these are some of the examples of how in the practical sense we're developing these solutions. Each of these is like a small startup within Ambrosos. So each, each of these has a team and we have different people kind of working on this with partners. And uh, our goal is to have this um, system of applications at some point down the road, uh, probably around Q3 this year, to integrate all of them together in a unified platform. So that later on companies or farmers or users could actually select what elements and what tools they want to have. Like, or at the same at the same time, making a, a very, very huge impact on uh, the value shape and the pro and the product building of Ambrosus. And that's and what we take most pride of is like your is your guys' amazing creativity. So like some uh, some of uh, the creative work that our community has been actually giving as a gift for us. So that's like and that's how the community of Ambrosus seems our team. So that's like you can see like some famous guys, you can see like who is the CEO, who is the CPO, and, and of course like a very special guy, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, who is like who is our virtual supporter, and you know that he is like the force is with us. And that's like, and that's like how we go to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like who goes to the moon, actually. So you can see, like, you can see Angel Versetti, Dr. Stefan Meyer, and like Unchained IoT legend, Dr. Vlad Trifa. So, like, this is it, gentlemen. And, like, so. Oh. So, that was just. Um, small kind of silly um, inter interac interaction, but at the same time, it's uh, quite important. We're very proud uh, about the artwork that our community is presenting, um, and uh, that we're, we've created the real movement. We've created the real passion amongst different people and artists, and uh, this is uh, something that we're very much appreciating. So thanks a lot, especially to the uh, core group uh, that are creating all this art. Um, at the same time, some people have said, well, you're only posting pictures here. So um, some people say, well, where's your blockchain? It's light years away, and so on and so on. So, um, so right now, Vlad and uh, Anthony are actually going to uh, show some action and make a live demo of, uh, of AmpNet. It's actually going to be the first live demo also that we're launching for our blockchain. So uh, Vlad, uh, Anthony, welcome on stage. Cool. <laughs> All right, I think we need to switch sides. Oh yeah, I'll let you do that. So thanks everyone for coming. I, you know, I really like what you guys designed, so thanks a lot. I think that's really awesome. I'm happy to wear it. Um, could I just say a few words about the overall state of technology product? So yeah, I'm head of uh, product, really working daily on trying to crack some very difficult problems, but it's always a lot of fun. So, you know, just jumping back to, to what Andrew said, uh, what we are doing is pretty simple. First, we're trying to provide a solution for managing data, supply chain data in a distributed way. So, and this is Embernet, Mnet. It's essentially a distributed ledger with different nodes. We're gonna go in detail uh, that afterwards. But the idea is we have a bunch of developer tools, APIs that allows companies, uh, software providers to connect to Amnet. For example, printers, they can just directly get unique IDs. They are printing an authorization to print unique barcodes that go onto products. So you know when a product has been printed, you can connect sensors, all sorts of real-time data 
push that to the chain. You can connect scanners, RFID tags, and a bunch of technology and hardware, physical hardware. But also, you want to share that data and leverage that in other systems. So SAP, of course, ERP, or MES, manufacturing systems. Um, so that's really how we've designed that. We want it to be a distributed ledger with a bunch of tools around, so you connect software and hardware. Now, when we're talking about data collection, what kind of data essentially? Well, the simplest and most basic data you want in supply chain is marking, identifying things. You know, you got a, you got a box of chocolate, you got a bottle of Coke, you got a pallet of uh, boxes that, that, it, that is going to China. How do you identify it? How do you uh, ensure that this ID is unique and hasn't been tampered with? So that's the simplest thing. And here we support obviously IDs, here numbers that can be put on barcodes. NFC tags, RFID, but also other type of trend tracers. For example, specific paint uh, and markers that has a unique chemical composition you just can't copy. Now, the second type of data we're trying to collect from supply chain is quality of product. And here we're talking all sorts of sensors to see what's inside a product. So if you have meat, for example, how do you ensure there are no harmful chemicals in there? How do you ensure that the quality of the meat itself is still good to be eaten? So here we're talking uh, biological, physical, chemical characteristics of products. And here we're exploring a bunch of sensors, and I will show you something in a minute. Then we have the third aspect, which is around the product. So not just the product, not just the palette, but where is it at any given time? What is the state? What's the temperature? Is there too much light, not enough humidity, and things like that? And the last one is integrity assurance. Because if you can't guarantee that someone isn't messing around with those other parameters, you can't really trust the data. So we're uh, putting a lot of efforts in the whole integrity element. How can you trust that the sensors themselves can actually be trusted with external cameras and other systems? And of course, we support a whole variety of communication, uh, local networks, so Bluetooth low energy, for example. Uh, but also Wi-Fi or very simply GSM. So now I'm going to talk you um, through very briefly the Amnet Gateway, and that's the thing we are about to release in the next couple of days. And when I mean release, we have already one that's up and running that you can start using to develop applications and interact with Ambrosis. But in the next couple of days, we're actually going to release the code, so you can take it, play around with it. Uh, we are more than happy for you to improve it, uh, and that's going to be really amazing to get your feedback on how that works. But essentially what that is, is we have the Ambrosis network, which I mentioned earlier, the Amnet, which is the blockchain part, where we store some of the data, some of the proof. But a lot of the data in supply chain is actually private data or not fully public data that you want to share with your partners. So for example, when someone orders 10 boxes of fish from me as a, as a fisherman, uh, how do them get some of the data that isn't necessarily public, for example, pricing and other things. So the way we've designed is to combine private data with public data in a very good way. And what the gateway does is very simply, uh, it's an application that you can run in the cloud on your laptop, wherever you want. It provides a REST API, so you can very easily start collecting, reading data, and interacting with the blockchain through REST without having to learn the whole Ethereum or blockchain underlying technology. You have a local data repository, and then you can decide who you share some of the data with. So here we're talking from other users of the network, how they can come and access some more private data that you want to share in a business context. So that's essentially how it works. Um, very simply, you need to create an Amnet account, as, and that's essentially, we will we'll provide the tools. But there are essentially accounts, as in Ethereum accounts, you can generate those. For now, just let us know if you want to give it a try and we'll create one for you. But next couple of weeks, we'll provide obviously a tool so that you can just generate those accounts yourselves. Because we don't want to have your private key, we don't want to touch it. So we're much happier if you generate that yourselves. But we'll do it if you insist. Now, the two type of entities that you store into Ambrosius are, first of all, assets and events. 
Assets are essentially a digital representation of anything that has a unique ID in your supply chain. That can be, you know, a container, that can be a box, that can be a unique product, a box of pharmaceutical with a unique ID, a pallet, a crate, or even a purchase order. So anything that has, that needs to be identified and you want to store a proof of the data associated with that in a non-immutable way, then you're going to create an asset for it. And it's not only physical asset, but also logical, like this one. And then once you have all those assets, all of those will be persisted, uh, will have a unique crypto secure ID that you can attach to it. Then you create events around those assets. And Anthony will show you in a minute all of that uh, beyond the slides, how it actually works. But events are things that happen at any given time, point of time to any of those things. So for example, if you're shipping that container, at some point you're gonna do a check. At some point you're gonna open it, or at some point you're gonna package it. So essentially the history of any product can be gotten by retrieving all those things back. And the, and the events can be created by devices, by applications. Now those assets, you can essentially link them together. So if you just take a product, that product is unique, it has a unique ID, that's put in a box, that box has 10 of those unique products, and you can start linking those assets together so you have a graph of the entire history of the product as it was created, as it moves throughout life. And then you have events. And events essentially is five pieces of information. Who, so who is the account, what is the device or the person or the application that has seen something, the what is what actually has been seen. So for example here, you want to show that this box was seen through the customs and that's the why, the why, what is, what is the event about, what happened, when it happened, here is a simple timestamp, where it happened and that's the geographical location. Oh, I'll speak closer, of course. And then you can add as many attributes as you want. And those attributes can be temperature from a sensor, for example. And you can create as many events as you want. Now, I was mentioning, <clears throat> just before we jump to the demo, I mentioned who can create those events. Well, I'm going to show you just one thing that we just received yesterday, so I'm very excited. Of course, it's Switzerland, so I had to bring Swiss chocolate. But it's what's inside the box that's important next to the chocolate. And it's this. So that's basically the new hardware sensor that we've been developing in the last couple of months. It's very tiny, it has quite a few months of autonomy. And essentially it has temperature sensor, humidity. And the way we've designed it is we ensured, we really put a lot of emphasis on the security part. So there is a private key on the device that never gets out, just like in a hardware wallet. It signs all the transaction, and then this one is using a BLE simply. You can use your phone to connect to it, read data from that device, and push it to browsers through events. And you can really trust the data that's in there. That's one of the cool things. So it's the first prototype fresh of the press, and you can put it in a box of chocolate like this one, and you can share it around. So that's, I'm not trying to bribe you, huh? Good. So that was it for, for the high part. Uh, now I'll let Anthony just show you a demo more concretely how you create those things and how it works uh, in practice. Thank you very much, Vlad. Um, of course, we left the meet to the end. So uh, let's step back a little bit and think wh why meat is so important and why we should c actually care, care about meat. Because Meat handling is very problematic. Uh, I don't know what's happening, but uh, a lot of a lot of things can go wrong when you when you handle meat. For example, uh, it can be packaging. Uh, the packaging can be contaminated with some chemicals. The plastics can be not very good. Uh, it can actually be counterfeited products. So someone pretends to be a different, like a high quality product from a very nice brand, and in it turns out it's uh, like from a Chinese uh, producer or some, some other uh, like counterfeiter, which no, it's not very good. Uh, then it can be contaminated. Uh, germs, toxins, insects, parasites, you name it. Uh, everything this has been found and will continue to be found inside of meat products. Uh, there are also other problems like um, undeclared ingredients that could be allergic for you. Uh, that can be for any products that, like, uh, I don't know what's happening. Maybe that's it. Uh, that can be glass, metal that was introdu introduced into the product during uh, production. 
And it can be as easy as uh, the cold chain not being handled properly, like interruptions in temperature. Um, and even if it's not completely interrupted, some, it's not someone that puts it out of the fridge, it's actually just the fridge wasn't that good and it got out of the range that is good for handling meat. So if you consider all that, suddenly we have a problem and this problem is called meat recall. So uh, if we found something, if we find, find it, it's super important that we remove the, 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 um, the meat out of the store so that nobody can get actually damaged or killed with it. Um, and that's what that's a one, just one solution that we would like to help solve. Um, and we help with all of the four aspects of it. We can help detect what if something dangerous happened to something. Uh, we can try to uh, scope down what particular product was um, was involved in this incident. We can help propagate the data about this incident so that people that can do uh, do something against it can actually take action. Um, it's a very interesting part that only like 40 or 30% 30 of uh, meat that should be recalled is actually ever getting recalled. So the, re the, the rest is, gets actually consumed or can, that can happen. And then in the end, we also try to and help to take action. So to, so to give the persons that can do something the tools to do this. And I will sh just show you that right now. Um, <laughs> okay, so this is a very, 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 very early um, dashboard. It sh just shows me the product. So imagine I am Joe. I work at a company uh, that sells products, so a retail store. Like it's not sending the data, so it's fine. Talk to you. Push. Everybody, everybody. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. Are we back again? Advertisement. <laughs> no, you wouldn't like it. You wouldn't like it. Camera. From the four sides? Yeah, just the demo, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is a very basic, um, like, very early beta uh, demo that we would like to show it to you. Uh, imagine that I am Joe. I work uh, at a retail store. I am responsible for handling the products and on the shelves. So uh, one of my responsibilities is to actually uh, track that uh, things that get out, like, that they expire that should be removed from the, from the shelves. I can, for example, see a product, uh, see that is, uh, it has a weight, uh, it was fabricated. Every line essentially is an asset in number. Yes, or a more uh, information of uh, like every product has a, like every piece of meat has an asset in Ambrosius. Um, and all of this like information that gets stored about it are stored as events on Ambrosius. So um, if, you're, if you take particular um, notice, there is something like that we call the Ambrosius ID, asset ID down here. Uh, we'll go, get back to this in a moment. But uh, let's assume that, first of all, what, what can happen? I can see that a product was recalled. For me as Joe, in the, working at the retail store, I know now that I need to go um, and remove it from the shelves. Uh, I would probably also have, like, check it here as recalled already, so that uh, not only recalled, but also removed from the, the supply chain. Uh, if I am, uh, for example, someone who is responsible for tracking or actually putting inside the recalls, I can select this uh, flank 
And I can actually create a new event on it, say that it was, for example, recalled because class fragments found. Okay? And now it's recalled. Um, so everyone in the block, everyone in the broker system will see it, and it will have a proof uh, also stored on the blockchain. So just to show you, show it to you, if I take this one and move to Postman, because yes, you will get a, a Postman collection with our tools, so that you can play around with the tools easily. And I put it in here. I actually have a history of the product inside of the Ambrosius. It was there is some event that is called product info. Basically, that's the first event that we will we'll create for a pro, for an asset, just giving it um, some identity, giving it uh, information of what it is and what like serial numbers and stuff like that. But then uh, there is also an event that was that is was recalled. Even if I now post a different event that will say that it was, for example, not really recalled, the information that it was recalled once will stay here forever. And that's, the, that's the whole idea. Uh, for the more technical around uh, of you, uh, I would just say that it's super immutable. It's built so that's super immutable. Uh, for example, there is a signature, which is the uh, just a private key signature of the whole data made by the owner, so the creator, creator of it. So this should match. Uh, all this is actually content addressable, so that's the hash of the whole content. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you try to change something in here, the hashes will not match, the signature will not match, and you it momentarily know something got wrong. Uh, you may also have noticed this one, bundle ID. That's something that we didn't present yet. Uh, it's a detail that at some point, all of this data will get into the blockchain. We call it bundles. It's, like, it's a way of uh, handling scalability a little bit. But the end result is you can then go to the blockchain, download the bundle, and then look if it's in the bundle, and then prove that this asset or this event is actually 100% valid or not. Um, yeah? Search like if you have 25 pieces of meat that all belong to the same cow and the cow had an issue or they found some salmonella, then in the dashboard you've just seen, you would search for all assets that belong to that cow and then you would create that event recalled on all of them. So anytime someone scanned, be the consumer, if there is like recipe attached, they would immediately see, hey, this meat has been recalled, bring it back to your shop or uh, other other application, anyone who is scanning that piece uh, even before it reaches the end consumer. So if the if the company who has processed it uh, creates a recall event in a, in a shop when they receive it and they scan it, they will see, hey, this meat has already been recalled. Just bring it back, and that information is attached to the product directly. Can be shown in an app. Also, imagine this uh, very simple scenario that, uh, as a customer, you go to a shop, you take the meat, you go to the to the uh, to the um, cash, like um, yeah, cash. to the point of sale, and the register actually the 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 the, the person who, who is uh, cashing you, he, he will scan the code and see, oh, this is actually recalled. I cannot sell to you because it will be actually bad for you. It was recalled. You can get something else, and sorry for the trouble. Uh, Okay, this is maybe this may be scary for the comp retail. Yeah, it's maybe scary for the retailers because yeah, you experience we just we, we just we just didn't sell you something bad. On the other hand, is it better to catch it at the last moment you can catch it or leave it for later to get some reports about injury? Uh, that's it. I have just two more things to show to you. Uh, first of all, we have a nice explorer for the blockchain. Um, so yes, we do pro run a private um, Ethereum network um, fork, um, and it's alive. The, the 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 gateway that we are that we we were just presenting is using it and it's running. And we also have a dashboard that shows uh, that we currently the three uh, validator nodes that run on the network with location and uh, stuff like that. So I think. 
And that's the test network which we're going to release anytime soon. The production one will come down the road, but that's the one we are using for all our customers. So that's the one to play with. Fine if you break stuff and the construction. So any feedback, anyone who wants to test it, I'd be more than happy to support you and give you all those tools in the next coming weeks. A bunch of announcements. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. And I think we will now go to the MIA question. All right. Thank Thanks a lot, everyone. Now it's the, your favorite part, it's AMA session with all the questions which have been reported by the community and collected by our community managers. And so like we are ready to start and the first question will go to Vlad directly. Yes, yeah, so get ready. Try. So okay, like Ambrosus has publicly stated that they wish to become the Android of IoT in terms of future scope. What are your plans for expanding to industries beyond food and pharma? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. I mean, the, the way we've designed the technology, those assets and events, you can map that in any supply chain, be it apparel, be it clothing, car parts, anything there is. But the technology underlying, you can use that way beyond uh, supply chain in general. Everything that has that needs to add a digital identity and some data associated with it to be proven, especially if those are real world assets like smart home and anything, you can easily start implementing that. So the plan is we try to do a really good job in the food and pharma because that's where there are huge problems that we want to solve first, but the technology we're looking at, uh, at doing a lot more than, than that. But will your proof of authority based blockchain be written from scratch or be a fork of another network? Like for example, VN is forking Ethereum. Sure, I mean, as you've seen now, we want to leverage what's out there. I mean, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. And I think Ethereum has been so far a very awesome technology with, of course, some limitations. And there were a lot of things that we had to change and adapt on top of it. So for now, we'll try to use Ethereum for as long as we can. But as soon as we'll have limitations specifically around scalability and things like that, that can't be solved fast enough, uh, will be uh, will will simply have no other choice than developing and, and adapt that to our own uh, to our own needs. Yes, and also to add to that, so my goal is to actually uh, deepen our research, specifically of designing our own solution that specifically solves the issues of supply chains and sensor to blockchain communication. So we're uh, planning to actually create a research group that will specialize in that, and we're in touch currently with a few technical universities in in Europe. Uh, and also here in Berlin uh, with a few stakeholders and teams. So if anybody's uh, researching specifically DLT architecture and cryptography and game theory is interested to, in researching and helping us build that solution, uh, we are quite open to collaboration. And so like the next one is a bit tricky, right? Like, why is AMB open source code not updated for so long? The amount of codes that has been uploaded is very small. Does the team have technicians to write codes and upload them? No, we're all uh, theoreticians. So. Now, of course, I mean, as you've seen, we've been really heavily investing in, in developing the technology to get to a point where it does the work we want with sufficient quality before releasing. So as soon as we publish the repository, there's like 40 of them in total in our GitHub at least. So, uh, 38 or anyway so but we'll only release three of them that's for sure that's the point but there's a lot of work happening in the back and we just want to make sure that we get to a place where it's actually adding value we don't want to be perceived as oh yeah we just took ethereum and added some some fancy stuff here and there we did a lot of the work behind the back and that's what people are going to see in the next couple of days as soon as we uh, announce it officially Yes, yeah, so also on my side, uh, recently we had one of the depositories becoming public and then some people have dug out something and they posted it on social media. Like, oh, what's that? What's this? And uh, of course, both in terms of communications and making announcements, as well as in terms of having this open kitchen approach whilst actually working with large corporates who want confidentiality, that's a tricky trade-off to maintain. Uh, therefore, we put stuff on GitHub as soon as it's ready for production 
And but, but for example, this particular release and others, uh, they will be on GitHub uh, as soon as it's uh, out there. And uh, this is the first public unveiling we've made. So in terms of progress, uh, we are trying to find the balance between showing the gradual progress we have, but at the same time actually making sure that when we communicate something, it's not like, oh, we've added a couple of lines of code, well done, but it's actually the product is ready. And today's showcasing of different solutions that we built for multi-billion dollar companies, it's uh, a reflection of that approach we're taking. Well, we need to open source, and we want all the stuff we're building and showing to be open source. Some stuff will come before others. Uh, and, and actually, on that front, a lot of corporates, of course, come to us and say, "Can you build that software for us? We're going to pay you X amount of dollars, or and so on and so on." We tell them no. Um, because we're running all the projects as an open source and AmpNet to make sure that to use that particular software, they need the token. So we're making sure that we make a proper token-based economy where token is not an add-on on top of some kind of software, but where the software cannot bring utility without the token. So that's our approach we're taking to this, and that's our bet on the open source part. Uh, you had a follow-up? Uh, you can actually interrupt if you want, yeah. Okay, uh, just a short question. The Hyperledger projects, um, Sawtooth, Fabric, etc., seem to be dealing with the same chain uh, problems or issues. Uh, do you see them as competitors? It's also open source. And two, uh, what are the advantages of Ambrosus over one of these other Hyperledger? So j just the basic part, and Vlad will go into the technical aspects. On the business side, um, the Ambrosus platform is actually also compatible with Hyperledger. We're, be we're developing the uh, bridges to link to it. So uh, we're not going to make a single bet on a single platform. So if anybody wants to take our solution, our product, and apply it to another blockchain, we're going to enable that. And this is also where our collaboration with Parity is very important. Parity have now released their bridges that connect different blockchains. And we work, I mean, that's why we're in Berlin today, uh, for these regular workshops to make sure that we get uh, the multi-blockchain compatibility. And maybe Vlad can uh, add some technical aspects on that. Yeah, I mean, I think Hyperledger is a very cool project with huge development efforts behind. And, you know, I think by experience, what we've seen in, in consortium, also in research, is uh, when you have too many cooks in the kitchen, then there's stuff that kind of slows down uh, in terms of how agile and how quickly can you fulfill the needs of your customers. And we want to keep a little bit of that agility. That's why we're not going like full way into creating a huge club where everyone it's like giving their opinion. And may, we'll certainly explore those things down the road, but we want to make sure we get something that our customers can come, don't have to spend like months learning about the technology and really get proficient at. That's why we're so focused a lot on those uh, REST APIs. We want to make sure that someone who just a basic JavaScript development experience, they can start building application on top of Ambrosius without having to integrate the whole thing in the back. So, Do you intend for there to be compensation for those developers that develop certain things on the on the platform? We'd, like we'd love to, yeah. I mean, uh, we, we we are doing that. Yeah. So we we do have a, a fund for developers who are contributing. There are quite a few people who are building stuff for us, so we're very excited about that. And I think that's one of the coolest way we can actually improve what we have on the technology level and and beyond. So. That was one of the questions in AMA, but since you're asking in any way, you can scratch that from the AMA part. Um, so concerning the dev funds, we do have a fund specifically of Amber tokens for developers. And we've recently run a competition, it's still ongoing, of Propose Your DAP. And uh, it's not just make a video and you know we are posted on our web and so on. We actually do uh, provide financial support to these projects to build either different tools that can help Ambrose's platform uh, more versatile, to be applicable to more industries or use cases, or to actually build a standalone project that somehow benefits our ecosystem whilst also um, actually achieving its goals. So from that perspective, the answer is yes. Okay, but from where does the money come that is uh, used to? From the token generation event. So we've, uh, Amber was issued through a TGE, and therefore uh, we've uh, set aside a fund specifically to build additional solutions on top of Ambrosia. So we have, we build the core, but uh, we actually engage in crowdsourcing quite a lot. So not only having specific partners and software developers, but actually harnessing the wisdom of community. We've recently had on Reddit uh, a crypto economic 
uh, for our Amber, basically we've asked for opinion and advice of the community and we offered them uh, rewards for contributing and we've received some very interesting insights. So we continue to be very kind of community oriented um, project from that perspective and we want to strengthen that. <clears throat> so my goal within the next few weeks slash months, I mean I always want to do it in weeks but it always takes months, but um, I want to make sure that we have it more structured. Right now it's just on a, on an ad hoc basis. People reach out to us, say, hey I have this idea, can you, you know, does it make sense or not? We always have competent people who are ready to advise that person. So it's not just you come and pitch or something. We make sure that we get the right specialists to help with that and so on. But my goal is uh, to create a proper structured entity there and we're actually, um, we, we are actually going to announce something like along those lines very soon. So uh, stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go, go ahead. So yes. one more. We, we do a kind of between the audience and then oh. AMA questions. Yeah. Well. So uh, if I understand properly, you're creating a map between the physical assets on your blockchain, right? So you mentioned that you have created an event system which can push uh, related events to an assets, assets, right? So my question would be that somebody who wants to tamper a physical asset is definitely not going to push any events to your blockchain, right? So how do you, how is this going to happen? Like, so how do you prevent... Um, how do you prevent someone who wants to tamper with the sensor, for example, on yeah, an sure. asset yeah. from the asset sending the stuff, right? So, I mean, the simplest thing is, if you if you take the sensor, which uh, which I've just shown, like this guy, there is, there is in it, um, first of all, I mean, this case, you can open it, and the reason we can open it is like the guys who received it didn't know you're not supposed to open it. Um, but essentially, there is a sensor inside that looks at the light and then motion, and if you open it physically, then it stops working, and you have to kind of reset it. So you know that first you're, you can't touch that stuff. Now, of course, you can create a Faraday cage or whatever <laughs> around it to prevent it from sending data. But uh, this is the whole power of what we of how we're conceiving and why we're combining IoT with the blockchain is that we think that physical security or just sensors or holograms or anything just on a product is good. Some technologies are better than other. But on their own, there would just never be enough. There's always going to be a smart ass that's going to find a way to hack the physical stuff. Same thing goes for the cloud. And I think combining the two in one single thing, uh, that's how you have the highest level of security. Because you can say, you know for a fact that this device is supposed to send data every X few minutes. If you're not receiving the data, at least in, in a way that is signed by the, the device, then you know there's something wrong. You don't know what necessary but at least you know that there's something wrong and you're not supposed to trust it. Does that also mean that you're going to ship uh, these kind of devices with every product? Well, it depends. I mean, uh, this is this uh, this is something that costs like, I don't know, 20, 20 bucks at most. But so it makes sense to put that when you have a big box and especially that it lasts a few months, you can reuse those guys, right? And technically there is a AA battery so you can remove, change it, reship it back. But the, this makes sense when you transport high value goods. When you have a whole box of fish, you want to make sure no one is like tampering with it. That's one way where it makes sense. If you take literally the example of the chocolate, I mean, that, that costs the same price as the box of chocolate. So it will not make sense to put that inside. But one thing we're super excited about is uh, all the developments happening in the printed electronics, embedded sensors, and you can actually, um, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so, so what's really interesting is that those technologies, uh, Stefan in our lab in Yverdon is really looking in details at the whole new types of printed sensors that are going to be much cheaper, much smaller than you can literally for one, two dollars attach to a physical product. And the more valuable your good, the more likely it's going to get counterfeited so the more likely people are going to invest money from preventing that to happen. Water counterfeiting is less of an issue. I'm not saying it isn't, but it's less. Maybe you should jump back to the questions and then back to the room because we have all spent. Yeah. <laughs> okay, like so user experience nowadays is a main part of every user-oriented technology. What will, do, what will Ambrosos do to improve UI, um, to improve UX? All right. Well, you I mean, we're we're interviewing quite a few very interesting people, and that's true. That's very interesting because when you put that technology, when you put the the software in the hands of someone, 
they don't necessarily get, especially the, the kind of audiences we talk to, customers, they don't know that much how blockchain works. And at the end of the day, they don't really care so much. They just want to know, okay, that's how it works. I think I understand. But they do care that the technologies we're building are actually very usable. So if you look at uh, what Angel showed before, you have those very light, nice looking user interfaces on products uh, or for people using that. In the back, you can have all the complexity you want, but you really have to look at the audience. But what we're doing is interviewing a bunch of people, and we definitely want to... You, you'll definitely see a few more cooler demos and stuff coming up in the next few weeks. Okay, like so the community demands the master nodes. So here's the, here's the sweet part. Okay, like and that's like that's, that's where Angel's going to take, take the lead. Do you wanna so first of all, like you and have announced that the biggest master node will be held by Ambrosus partners, companies to secure the network. My question is, will this company need to buy AMB tokens from the markets like Binance or KuCoin, or they will be given the tokens by the team? Yeah, so this part was addressed um, before. Um, when we mention partners, it does not necessarily mean corporates uh, or entities specifically working on industrial use cases. The point will be about doing the know your customer verification as well as getting the legal uh, contract signed with the entity to assure that the network's integrity is observed, to make sure that there is a uh, guaranteed SLA and some other aspects. So from this perspective, we are talking about uh, actors who would not necessarily just put a certain amount of amber to stake in the master node, but also would guarantee um, the performance. Uh, so that was the reasoning for mentioning the partners, because the most obvious partners are the companies with whom we're working on these uh, pilots, on these uh, tests and projects. Uh, but other entities could include universities potentially, and we are talking to quite a few schools, and we are actually uh, proposing to them to host master nodes and to see how that would work, because a public institution could be a trusted member of the network. So um, this is the aspect where um, it's not necessarily the corporates will have to do that only. Um, and in terms of where uh, the entities would get Amber from, um, I recently talked about this on the Crypto Weekly podcast. The question is, um, do the companies or the corporates have the legal framework to purchase tokens from these exchanges? Currently, the answer is no, of course. But in the forthcoming months and years, as the crypto industry matures and all these, uh, the, um, actually, the exchanges are already becoming more legitimate. So you, ha you see some big guys moving to Europe, OKEx, Binance, uh, um, what was the third one? I think Bitfinex. They're all moving away from different offshore zones to the European Union. And after the SEC's announcement about you know, any crypto uh, exchange platform not being SEC compliant is by default illegal, uh, is going to make some uh, impact on the industry. So once the proper regu uh, regulatory framework is here, the corporates will be able to access these platforms more easily. And from that perspective, uh, I can speculate with high level of confidence that they would be able to acquire it from the markets. Yeah, and so like, here is one from uh, our hodlers. Like, what are the details of the incentive plan for a long-term holding of AMB? Okay, um, I do hope it's clear um, without my saying that there is something. That's, that's a legal answer here. But importantly, uh, for incentivization, we're looking at different models um, that will have long-term participants specifically providing the security and performance of the network consistently and for long-term being rewarded for that. So it's not about long-term holders of Amber itself, but if you are maintaining the nodes in the network and give it security performance, uh, then for those who do it on a bigger scale, the rewards will be bigger. So that's uh, on the multi-tiered master node question. But I won't go into too much details because the crypto economic unveiling is going to be at, at EdCon in Canada in a couple of weeks. Uh, but all I can say is that we do take uh, the long-term approach and therefore the overall design is also for long-term network performance. Yes. I know the team has been working with regulators to have a compliant token economics model. From this, is AMB considered a security by regulators? due to the staking and dividend model, or no? 
So um, currently the status is a uh, utility token. Uh, so this is the status that we currently maintain. Um, we are investigating a number of uh, possible strategies as in what the right now the approach both in Switzerland and seems that emerging in the US is that once you get a certain status of the token, it's not fixed forever. It can evolve over time. So before that ever can happen realistically, the regulators need to come up with a proper framework of how they treat companies based on the changing status of their um, of their tokens. So we are still, you know, ne negotiating this part with regulators. But importantly, this um, this should not be considered as dividends either way because this is not a, a percentage from a token that you get because you hold it. It's the fact that you put the tokens into the nodes as the mechanism to ensure that the integrity and performance of the node and of the network will be there and that the data will not be, uh, will not be what's happening there? <laughs> yes, well. Um, <laughs> so, so the important aspect is, is that um, the reward is for network performance, not because I just hold AMP. But importantly, of course, those nodes that do not maintain the data integrity or those nodes that are found to be cheating, their staking is going to be slashed. So we're going to implement these mechanisms to assure that there is a good behavior incentive. So, but what is the incentive to run a master node? Is there an incentive like a transaction fee or what's the difference between a dividend and transaction fee on the master node? I think that's more of a legal distinction here than a technical one. So uh, in terms of uh, transaction fees, uh, that was one of the topics of today's discussion at the workshop, both on the technical level as well as on legal and regulatory framework. So um, simply, simply said, these are not dividends because they are running from network performance. So it's, it's the same answer here. And the transaction fees are collected again based on the fact that the person is running the node. And to run the node, they need a certain hardware, as well as a certain number of tokens to, to, to run it. But the tokens serve as a collateral, so to say, or as a, as a staking mechanism. But it's, it's because of the performance of the node that the person can get the transactions, the part of the transactions, and get rewarded for them. And so like, we move into the next block of questions on business and adoption. So like, can we expect to see the first cases of adoption and use of the AMB platform this year, already this year? I think uh, you saw them today earlier in the presentation. Um, and we're um, working with a few companies who are making consumer-facing applications too. So for example, on the, on the beef, um, in Korea specifically, there is a project ongoing um, where they actually want to make it as a consumer-facing solution on the quality assurance of beef. And uh, this is the uh, project specifically that's going to be rolled out for the consumers. So in, in it's, this year is more than realistic on that front. But in terms of the corporate solutions, uh, building the stuff, uh, we've already showcased that today. Yes, and are decentralized applications already being developed by the AMB industry partners for their supply chain needs? Well, the same, we've demonstrated them today, yes. All in place. Yeah. But like, also, like, Ambrosos is ri like running a lot of hackathons, so like the community wonders. Like, how successful have those hackathons actually been? Well, I think Vlad and Anthony can give us good insights. They've been running quite a few. Even Anthony, because he both participated <laughs> in that. Yeah, actually, I participated in one uh, hackathon in Yverdon. Uh, sorry, I will just go up here. Uh, yeah, so the Meet Rico one was uh, actually presented first. Uh, it came out as an idea on the hackathon, so... Uh, I think there are a lot of smart people going to the hackathons. Uh, also investors um, in Ambrosius that I would say they have smart ideas and we would love to hear them and yeah, just give us a call. I mean, uh, just overall, uh, we participated both organizing and participating as participants. I think for, for us, for me, at least from a product perspective, what's really valuable is to see new ideas that come up, like how to use the technology. And we learn a lot about our product. Like we just put it out there and say, hey, try to do that. Well, I can't do that because you didn't implement that thing. Oh, yeah. Well, so I think that's a lot of learning that's very valuable. And I think 
it's very, very encouraging to do those kind of things in general. I mean, not trying to praise just the hackathon part, but the testing and really having different people coming with idea is incredibly valuable. You just need to think how do you match challenges and what part you provide, and it's easy to be like too broad at the hackathon and sometimes like completely miss the topic, but uh, it's very interesting to, to learn from that, so. And also from the business perspective, of course, it's um, hackathons also serve as uh, some kind of a crowdsourcing uh, because people who do create interesting solutions, they're invited to continue working on them or we can assist in different ways of bringing that together. So we have had some interesting projects and uh, uh, some of them will hopefully be uh, part of Ambrosia soon. And we're also planning to have more hackathons over the next few months in collaboration with uh, universities, mainly in Europe, but also increasingly in uh, some countries of Asia and North America. Okay, like, so IBM sensors look uh, quite nifty. When the opportunity presents itself, will you take full scope of comparative advantages and work together to adopt technologies created by other projects, such as IBM Hyperledger, Origin Trail, Devery, Chainlink, Smart Containers? Like, what's the plan? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously the answer is yes. I mean, we're tr we are we come from the open source community. We and what that essentially means is like builds on what others build, right? Standing on shoulders of giants. So we'll definitely look at new technologies. We are not a hardware company per se. So the reason we design our own hardware is just because we couldn't find anything on the market that was programmable and secure enough to fit into our uh, requirements. And if there are things out there that we don't know, please send us a mail. We'd love to try them and test. So we have a bunch of hardware from all sorts of manufacturers, open source one, commercial ones. So we definitely want to work with other, other hardware for sure. In terms of software, definitely. I mean, if we find partnerships and companies that add value and we can add value to what they do, so we're complementary, absolutely. I mean. Uh, why, why not? And so what are the biggest challenges which you consider Ambrosus is facing at the current moment? Like, so like what strategies like, are, do you implement to travel, troubleshoot? Sure, I mean, from a technology side, maybe just a, a thing. I mean, it's all the things related to scalability, uh, obviously. So we're following very closely what's happening in the Ethereum community. We're participating to most, like pretty much every major um, Ethereum developer conference and event we can uh, we can go to so we're definitely looking at what's out there we are doing as Andrew mentioned a lot of partnerships as well with academia and researchers people from different uh, circles because there's a lot to be learned so we're very active to that and that's just one of the many challenges but you know we can spend hours talking about things ahead but that's what's exciting so yeah and it's, it's also, not only about the scalability of the uh, blockchain, it's also about the scale of the amount of events, uh, events and assets that we want to create. Uh, if you can just figure out, like, think about one uh, vendor and, uh, let's say, chocolates, they produce a lot of this, and we cannot just push it directly to blockchain. So, uh, you can imagine there, there, there are some nice technical problems to solve, and I think we are very good at, that, at it. So, yeah, you will see in a moment. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> is, is anybody claiming it from the community? Um, yes, um, just uh, to bring, uh, I'll just give the business uh, aspects of um, challenges. I think an interesting challenge is the fact that we have to work with a lot of corporations that wish we would never exist. And that's interesting because we're trying to make them change the way they do business. They don't want to change the way they do business. They've been making money on this intransparency, opaqueness, and uh, a lot of uh, stuff being uh, hidden or manipulated or changed. However, now they can see that blockchain is no, I mean, there's a lot of hype, but there's also a lot of long-term potential here. And they can see uh, that if they don't do it first, their competitors will. So reluctantly, they do have to work with companies to, to implement this and to make supply chains more transparent, to give more insights into the products, production and distribution stages and so on. So um, we are finding ourselves in this yeah, interesting um, kind of place where they do want to work with us, 
but just because they know if they don't, they might lose to the competitors. So that's, that's the first interesting element that <clears throat> they're basically dragging their feet. And uh, sometimes it's, uh, we've had a few companies, uh, one of them, uh, I guess I never signed an NDA with them, so I can give a public name, it was Monsanto. So these guys are like, oh, we want to work with you. Um, you know, we have some people say we're bad guys and so on and so on. And I'm saying, ah, oh, okay, um, so how can we help? And then they say, blah, 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 a lot of negotiations. But in the end, uh, after the proposals, the project outline, et cetera, et cetera, they say, okay, let's do it like this. You have this blockchain of yours. We send you an Excel spreadsheet, and you put all that data on your blockchain, and then we put it on our products. I say, well, that's not how it works. The point is not just to send the data on the blockchain and you know, tell to people, see, it's on the blockchain, therefore we're good. It's about going back to the source, going back to the sensors in this case, and making sure that there's data integrity instilled in the protocol that sells the data from the sensor to the blockchain. And that's the part where, of course, for a lot of corporates, it gets tricky. Same with the master node system that uh, we're developing. There is um, obviously an interest of uh, maintaining the public network versus the desire of the corporates to maintain the privacy of data. And coming up with a solution that can you know, hopefully satisfy the requirements of both sides. That's, that's an interesting challenge that we're tackling and uh, some of the brightest minds are on this and we've, we've, we have some interesting proposals on that. And um, finally, in terms of the um, application of the technology, there is still, of course, a very long way to go for the general adoption of, of anything blockchain related. So a lot of people are talking about it, few people understand it and less, yet less, Less, yet, yet fewer people actually work and operate on that. So our goal over there is to make different tools uh, as quickly as possible so that people could, you know, our first goal is not to develop a bunch of apps. Our first goal is to develop a bunch of tools that could help people develop a lot of apps. So that's the approach. We want to make a truly community-run um, uh, project. So, so that's, that's been uh, our approach. And finally, from the communications perspective, the challenge which a lot of our online community does know. It's, it's the fact that we, obviously, I mean, you can see the nature of this meetup, right? There is a live streaming with lots of people. There is, a, we have a, hundreds of thousands of people on different social media and so on and so on. So we are a very public project. But we work with a lot of big companies who want to keep stuff confidential. And uh, this is also the very, yeah, it's, it's, I would say it's a big challenge to navigate that, to uh, find the balance between keeping the community informed about our progress and our success, especially when you cannot talk about it. And today's event is one of our attempts to try and find the common ground between us showing you know, what we've built, maybe give a profile of some of these companies, and there are some uh, you know, uh, online detectives who've kind of you know, placed the dots. Um, so, um, you know, and it's fun, it's fine like that. But the point is, our goal is to show that we've had progress. Um, unfortunately, we cannot share a lot of it until the confidentiality is lifted. But being a community-run project with a token of its own, you know, which is like the market on steroids and so on, it's, 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 we do have to navigate quite a few uh, aspects there. So I think that's, that's an interesting approach. We're trying to maintain it. And hopefully with, uh, with uh, Stephen joining us specifically as the new chief marketing officer, we will find the right approach to create the movement. I mean, we already have the movement, but to actually create the proper brand image and recognition and make sure that uh, we, do, um, we do actually get more uh, participants in the network whilst at the same time continuing to work with corporates and uh, making those uh, announcements and partnerships public. I think it's time also to ask some questions from the community over, over, over here, from the, from the audience. So do you guys have any... Okay, I, you, I, I'm giving the turn because you have already asked. Thank you very much. Um, you speak about the partnerships with uh, different companies. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, so you are incorporated since one year, right? Uh, and uh, how challenging it was to get the first clients in this uh, uh, partnership and uh, how is your business model works basically like from business sides, how you make money. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's a, at least a two-part question. The first one is how did we get started on getting the first partners on board? Well, connections, very simply. 
Uh, for example, our uh, chief technical officer, Stefan Meyer, who's not here today, he's arriving tomorrow. Um, he used to work as an R&D lead at Nestle. So obviously he's had a number of contacts in Nestle and he was also the co-founder of uh, EPFL Food and Nutrition Center. EPFL is uh, one of the top European universities and the Food and Nutrition Lab is the largest food R&D cluster over there. And he created it and created a network of 300 corporations in food sector. So that's the simple answer to that. It's, it's not as easy as it sounds, but it's kind of very straightforward question. But um, this alone is, is a good door opener but there are a lot of projects uh, out there who do have a lot of influential people on board who can also open doors for you. Sometimes they own stuff where you want to make a partnership, then those partnerships are fairly easy to make. Um, we do have those capabilities on our side, but we don't pursue it that way. We actually pursue it with, a, here's a value proposition for you. And um, it may not necessarily be a good value proposition for that particular company. And when it's not, we iterate until it is a good value proposition with them. We just you know, we say, okay, let's run a small pilot. You can test out how one particular tool of Ambrosus works, and that's why we make it open source and free. So they, they don't have to say, okay, I mean, okay, what, what, I have to weigh all the options. Say, just try it out. And then they try it out and they say, wow, okay, that works, that's nice. And I can also see all the whole transactions on the blockchain. And then we can offer them additional tools and solutions. That's how we got quite a few companies on board uh, as well, just starting with a small particular area and uh, expanding on that. And uh, ultimately, in terms of the uh, model over here, why do we make the software open source? What's the, uh, you know, the money-making point? Uh, that's what I mentioned earlier, that the apps at the industrial level we require Amber, our token, uh, to be used in order to uh, get the utility from that particular software. So that's, that's our model. And of course, the team is uh, the largest token holder at this stage. So there is a fairly obvious uh, financial incentive here for the team. One thing to that, I mean, what's maybe something very particular about us is we do have quite some experience from the business side as well. So when we go see clients, the easy path is exactly what uh, Andrew mentioned earlier, which is, hey, we get some extra spreadsheet, put them on blockchain, make a video on YouTube, everyone is happy. That's the easy part, right? And we could do that like all time long. The hard part is actually going there and saying, no, guys, you and push back and say, no, you don't just want to put your Excel spreadsheet on the blockchain. You do, first, it doesn't make sense. And we heard all kinds of things people wanted to put on the blockchain just because, especially in their own data center that no one sees, which basically is a database. So that's the wrong approach. What we try to do when we walk there is, hey, guys, let's try to analyze some of the problems you currently have and how we can use blockchain technology so that you can go back to your executive board board and show them here by implementing the blockchain technology or whatever that way, this is 10%, 20% you can spare this year. This is how you can regain the trust that Stephen mentioned just earlier. This is the kind of hard challenges we're trying to go after and that's how it is. So uh, <laughs> it's just so much fun. <laughs> yes. I know. Okay, you so can just sit down and then watch up, but yeah. Okay, so like, like actually time for the next question and... Yeah, so I want to go into one of the use cases um, is um, food delivery. So right now you have um, intermediaries on the food delivery between the, the, the people who deliver it and the um, customers who eat it, the restaurants. There's always a company that's operating like you know, how it works. Or things like that. And what you have, your value proposition is that you want to connect to the, uh, the user directly to the um, deliverer so that deliverer can get a fair... Um, a fair pay without an intermediary um, in the way, right? But those intermediaries exist for a reason, right? They're entire billion dollar companies um, who are focused on just being the in intermediary for that operation and making sure everything goes quickly and how it should be and all the information is entered and how do you tackle those, all those problems that those intermediary firms um, are solving today. Yeah, I mean, that's a very important question. I mean, it, obviously the easy way is like, oh, we're going to take out all the intermediaries and direct, direct. But when you're looking at tuna, you know, it's not like you order like 10 tons of tuna and I'm going to FedEx that to you tomorrow magically, right? It's not how it works. Obviously, you need a company in between that does those things and we don't want to replace them. We just want to reduce the number to the minimum literally required and make each step of the process more 
more transparent from what comes in, what goes out, and guarantee that there is no delta there in either up or down. And also, we want to make sure that uh, they are efficient. If we can provide those intermediaries new technology that make them much faster at handling all the paperwork, and especially when you're looking at the commodity trading market, there's so much inefficiencies out there, like so much paper, so much human, so much phone calls, and so little digital technology, huge opportunities to reduce the time it takes to ship products across the world, uh, if need be, reduce the and, and ensure that a product essentially comes to you fresher, faster, so you don't need to fill it with as many chemicals as it's happening today. So this is really our goal. Is That's why we're looking at every person in the supply chain, how we can deliver something very specific for them, not necessarily at the whole chain, because I think everyone in the room and online gets the value of using blockchain for supply chains. But specifically, when you look at one person who is like, OK, I'm a commodity trader of coffee in Geneva. Why should I use that? Well, that's a very important question we're asking ourselves all the time. How can we make that guy's life easier, more efficient, and essentially allow him to reduce his costs so his margins stay essentially the same? I mean, they have good margins, so that's hard. But yeah. So um, further to your question, there is, of course, the, one of the most favorite narratives in the blockchain space, cut out the middleman and so on doesn't always work and sometimes it's not even required to, to cut out the middleman. Uh, it's used too much as a swear word in this context. When we worked on a coffee supply chain use case, there was the specific goal of providing access to farmers in African countries to new markets to sell their coffee, hopefully at a fair price. <clears throat> I mean, obviously there is the fair trade company and so on, but those usually rely on cooperatives. What if farmers are in isolated areas or otherwise cannot directly participate, but they do have access to online, to the internet. So there, um, we, the marketplace that we showed earlier, actually one of the iterations of it was used specifically for that use case. And um, for these uh, farmers, the buyers were not the end clients, actually. They were not the people who would consume the coffee, they were distributors based in China. <clears throat> and these distributor, distributors needed good quality coffee, and those distributors were small distributors. So they were not your, not your typical bad guy. It was just also people trying to make a living and trying to address the need. Local markets wanted good coffee. These guys wanted quality coffee. And as a distributor, you also don't know if what you're getting is good unless you have a trusted partnership or relationship with the client. So you also are the one at risk. And maybe if you supply them bad quality coffee, your customers will never come back to you. So for these guys, it's the same problems. How do I know that the coffee I'm getting is quality? And if I get it from these farmers, is there any way for me to guarantee it's coming from that farm? It's got this quality. So here, distributor can also benefit from that. And uh, they are not necessarily a bad actor. So in that use case, um, usually if if uh, the Chinese companies want to ensure that they're getting good coffee, they would test them, uh, test the coffee their, themselves, right? They would take samples of it and, and look at its quantities. But um, you want to make it from the side of the, um, the producers who can ensure or at every stage of the, the delivery that the quality still remains good. So you assume that when it's packaged is when its quality is measured. Uh, if you take coffee or olive oil, is the moment when <clears throat> is the moment when something is packaged. Sorry for my voice; I've been traveling a lot. <clears throat> so, um, when you put something on the package, you link the data to that particular product, and this is when the quality, like before that, the quality assurance takes place. So afterwards, you may care about the external parameters, maybe temperature, humidity, or any other aspects. But in terms of internal quality, well, during the slides early on, um, one of the slides I've shown was, and I'm quickly going to kind of to repeat that, one of the competences of our team is specifically working also on packaging, whether that's uh, seals, labels, or otherwise anti-tampering mechanisms. So once the product is packaged, the data about its quality is stored and linked to a particular package. And, and this is where you get the quality data from. And beforehand, you couldn't do it because right now, unless you have an individual serial number on a product, you cannot verify if it's unique or not. And even if it is, um, you may have just multiple products with the same serial number. And there are very often not that many ways to check which one is fake and which one is not. So these are the 
seemingly small, but in terms of their impact, huge problems we're tackling. If you're talking about the human loss, it's literally hundreds of thousands of people per year simply die from consuming counterfeit or low quality medicine or a placebo that they want to buy medicine to get cure and they get just nothing, they get chalk or something like that. Uh, or we're talking about uh, tens of billions of dollars of losses in uh, food markets due to fraud and mislabeling. So these are the areas we're tackling. And the most important here, and that's that's really the word chain in supply chains, because you have stuff happening all over. And first you have like raw green coffee. And I was like two days ago talking to a very interesting company that does direct trade, direct trade coffee. And they are up against like the big commodity traders in the coffee space that just sell some beans called coffee. So here the whole point and the whole value of these small companies is that no, no, you're not just buying beans, you're actually buying these beans from this farmer and we guarantee you this traceability. But they are a shipment company, they take care of the insurance, they take care of everything in between, just uh, they are not a high-tech company building like blockchain stuff, but they see the value and that was a very interesting discussion because if they, they can just prove further and strengthen the reputation and the quality, then it becomes interesting. And we're very interested as well when we talk to smaller producers because their whole USP is like high quality goods. And if they can prove it and justify, well, sorry, this craft beer is twice the price of the other green one. Well, there is a reason why it's the case. And here we put those tools in place to show you. That's why it's interesting that the actual traceability starts way earlier and you have all those quality checks and the most important thing what's really exciting is like the delta between what comes into a box and what comes out so if you're buying like 10 kilograms of coffee beans high quality coffee beans but you're selling 100 there is a little discrepancy right there and that's where the whole blockchain element becomes really interesting is that well you cannot sell that many uh, if you only bought that much and that's one of the stuff we're trying to build into a smart contracts is to guarantee that you cannot print more 250 coffee, 250 grams bags of coffee than you actually have bought for that batch. Yeah, if I can add one more thing to it, um, Vlad mentioned chain. Uh, you are only part of it, and in the edge case that something goes wrong in the end, actually having data about what, who handled what at which moment, it actually can help figure out who was his to, who who is to blame and. For companies that do a very good job and they actually re-perform, that's good because they can show that was not us. And that's about trust. It, like We replace trust with accountability and we have the data to prove it. What, what can be better? I've got a question about your uh, quality insurance as well. Um, so. Uh, so far, you've talked about like single ingredients, uh, single ingredient acids like uh, uh, pieces of meat or raw materials, uh, materials like coffee. Uh, however, what I'm interested in is, um, say, the product would be a more complex one. Say, pharmaceuticals. We had a big scandal in Germany that um, involved uh, chemotherapy bags that were essentially being frauded in a very high percentage of. of of the cases and then what was delivered to the hospital or to the doctor was just salt water and no one knew about it so what I'm interested in is in those more specific cases where you would uh, need a more um, expertise person to actually ensure that um, what is supposed to be in the back is actually what's in the back um, how are you gonna do that comes back to the printed electronics things, for example, uh, and that's why we're looking at all sorts of seals, all sorts of things that can actually so sense some chemical properties inside. That's one of the answer. The other one is like, in that case, what happened is like, I assume someone took the real thing, they replaced it with bad thing and resold the good things again, right? I assume. Well, like I, I think what yeah yeah so basically they substituted some high quality thing by a lower quality so they can sell twice the same amount of uh, does that mean, is that what happened I think what happened was uh, that they just put in the salt water in the first place and then they they sold those packs okay so that was like the manufacturer who did that the ph uh, pharmacist yeah the pharmacist okay 
Yeah, I mean, but what's the incentive for him to do that? Because you're diluting or you're replacing some high quality good by a low quality good. What's the reason someone does that? Because the the profit is is so much higher. The pharmaceuticals so, would be would be so expensive, <clears throat> and the water is not expensive at all. So that means did they buy the real thing, or actually they never bought the high quality good? They just said they bought it. Okay. So they get the raw ingredients, they don't have to buy directly. Okay. For some special yeah. So there is a decision. You get a couple of bad guys out there, yeah. and they do as you say. <clears throat> And I think that's right. I mean, the reason I'm asking you those questions is that if you put it the other way around, where you're a really good pharmacist and you're like, look, I'm fully transparent. I want to show you that uh, I'm selling the real thing. The best way for them to do that is to prove how much ingredients they bought and how much they're selling back. So if they cannot prove they bought those things in the first place, then uh, they're not going to be able to sell that much afterwards. So, And I think that's a very good example as well. I think there was another use case with like um, uh, breast implants where um, a German company looked at them and they were like well that's a very good high quality process you can go ahead and they approved the quality of those breast implants but what happened is uh, just after the quality testing person left, they replaced the silicone, like medical silicone, by commercial, industrial grade silicone. So obviously lots of people had issues. And what's the reason? Well, they couldn't have produced that many if they didn't buy the raw ingredients to start to begin with. And that's why it's really interesting and that's why we're working a lot uh, so earlier stage, if you can prove that, hey, this is what's coming in and that's why I'm selling you so much organic uh, yogurt because I bought like 500 kilograms or whatever, a proportion of that, that's the interesting part of this transparency. That's why I meant by in what comes in needs to come out. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I will s use the opportunity to ask the second question. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> I'm taking the time. Uh, so I I'm actually coming from the biopharmaceutical industry and I have my own startup in the uh, biopharma industry and I'm very much interested in blockchain and smart contracts specifically. And I saw you guys have a track therapeutics, which I really know also like- a what? Track therapeutics in partnership. Oh, therapeutics. Yeah, so if it's not confidential, would you please a little bit uh, give some insights what kind of like project or partnership was there? So thank you very uh, much. I think besides for what's in the public press release, I'm not authorized to give more yeah. details. So if you know them well, better reach out to them directly. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not, I don't know them directly. Oh, I'm saying okay. like I heard about them. You've heard about them, yes. Uh, heard. Yeah, well, Ambrosius does have a few partners that <laughs> some people have heard about. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, in that particular use case, I can't comment too much about what we do with them because uh, <laughs> they've agreed to us confirming that we're working, <clears throat> that we're working on some things, but we haven't been authorized to uh, reveal further details. Um, with similar companies, we work with a number of companies that are similar, uh, just much bigger, so pharmaceutical uh, companies. Um, interestingly enough, we work with them on the use cases that I've uh, outlined in my bigger presentation of the, um, of the ecosystem. One of them is an insurance. So with one company, uh, which is a large pharmaceutical company, uh, we initially proposed what would be a basic supply chain, quality assurance, and so on and so on. And it, it actually we found out that they had a basic problem. They said, okay, that's great, but we have a more basic problem of our processes still being paper-based. So there, uh, actually, they want to use our blockchain of coupling quality assurance with payment settlements. So this is an example of uh, a collaboration also with a pharmaceutical-based uh, um, entity. Uh, and specifically what we do with them. So we often do similar things with pharma companies. So interestingly, we often provide them additional services that may not necessarily be our core expertise, but it's a nice add-on to have. And with that particular pharma, it's, uh, it's an interesting use case. And next week, actually, we're uh, going to uh, meet for another workshop with them. So there will be 
I will try and make a post on our online community about how the collaboration goes and what we do because there are some interesting general insights about what the pharma is interested in. But importantly, pharma, uh, I mean, I've mentioned it in one of the interviews recently, but I'll repeat it again. It's a very conservative industry, obviously, and they're very, very, very careful about whom they engage with on a long-term basis. So uh, they've only moved to the cloud last year. We talked to one big pharma who've only moved to the cloud last year because it took them so long to get all the approvals, to get all the regulations in place, and so on and so on. It's, it's a long process, and they want, they want a partner with whom they can regularly, so to say, play a ping pong, you know, just regularly iterate, you know, uh, throw the idea here and there. And sometimes the final iteration of what you have is completely different from where you started. But what's important is that they do get to use your blockchain network. And that's uh, one of the things that, for me personally, is uh, exciting is, uh, Ambrosius uh, being this backbone for the large pharma companies to reposit their data and additional value services. Maybe they can even figure out what they want from us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another question. AMA is still there. So, hi. Um, I have the question that the whole system works when the whole supply chain is on the blockchain, right? So if there's a missing not link, necessarily. Not, not necessarily. Yeah. So if there's a missing link, so we have parcel services in between, all of them have their own batch codes, all of them have their own systems and ITs and so on. So how do you address this problem of having like integral supply of the supply chain? You know, if there's a missing link, uh, it stops and then you, you don't know. That's exactly the point when I was mentioning us creating these different building blocks, different tools, and then unifying them in a single platform. That's going to be exactly to take this approach of, of a constructor of a sort of pick and choose the tools you want to have that are relevant to your needs. Um, it's definitely not going to be next year or the year after that either Ambrosius or anybody else in this world, I dare say that nobody in the world, will have a full supply chain on the blockchain. It's not going to happen next year or the year after. It's going to be maybe in five or ten years. Or maybe with some specific supply chains like high value products and there it's not about the quality maybe it's about is this product real or fake. You know, maybe just tracing the product. Okay, that's easier to do. But if you're talking about taking a complex product and having all the ingredients traced and their quality being assured and that being merged into this product and then the end consumer receiving all that and that all being integrated along the supply chain is going to take a long time to get there. So our approach to this is take specific products, either specific products that do have a stronger need for, uh, for quality assurance, examples are baby food, pharmaceuticals, for obvious reasons. Or take high value products where of course uh, the cost of the product is so high that it would be worth the money for companies to integrate this. Or we take a particular part of the supply chain that's particularly painful. So there is a part in the supply chain where the food goes from farmers to the uh, first sorting stations. And 40% of food waste it takes place in that particular part of the supply chain. So here we're talking about 40% of food just getting destroyed due to bad storage conditions and so on. And there are a lot of initiatives at the United Nations and at the local governments to reduce food waste and to find systems that could help them with that. So that's one particular problem that actually basic quality assurance techniques could help reduce that problem. So these are, you know, we tackle particular so-called sweet spots or hot spots, the areas which can bring the maximum outcome based on the minimum technological input. And from there, we just expand and we provide additional blocks and hopefully five or ten years later on when there are, you know, smart cities with intelligent self-managing supply chains, Ambrosus will be their blockchain of choice. And uh, will there be any like incentive for a parcel service in between? So why, like, I'm delivering stuff, right? So why should I use an additional system and change my IT? So I have my own codes, I scan them, and I need to update my software. Or how does that work? Like, how is it? There is a very simple uh, competitive advantage answer to this question. Uh, a lot of delivery companies or distributors or logistics companies for that matter, they are commodities in terms of they offer a homogenous product that's nearly identical and there are very few differentiators. And a lot of them are struggling basically to find clients. There are, there are, there is a, it's a very low uh, profit, a low margin 
uh, area and so on, so they do need differentiators. And if they can actually tell their customers, and that's another use case you remind me of. We work with a, a, a company, they're based in Scotland or whether they, so they basically deal with uh, supply chains for one of the largest luxury stores in, in, in London. Uh, and, and they specifically, uh, of course, we're talking about the fact that, you know, we have these guys as our customer. And it's, it's a great customer, we don't want to lose them, but there are other guys who want to approach them and say, we can deliver it either cheaper or, or easier or whatever, just try and take them away. So here, that's why they actually, they were the ones who approached us, they say, we want to discover a new competitive advantage for us to, to work with our clients. So that's the basic value proposition here. Like, like a bet, like a fair trade or bio, like a seal in the end. Yeah, Correct. Yeah. That you've transported something from A to B. And if you're a good transporter and you want to invest some in guaranteeing that everything in your truck travels at this and that temperature, and that's the use case here. It's like you take those sensors, you put them in boxes, and as soon as they are in a truck where you have other devices reading the data from those devices and streaming that, online at all times uh, and that's one of the projects we're actually working on which we haven't unveiled I didn't do it I just said but um, that's gonna be live we're gonna talk in, in a very short amount of time that's very very interesting because you can say well of course maybe I'm not the cheapest one but at least I'm the only one from what I can see in the transportation industry that gives you like our products everything you ship in my truck you get full traceability and temperature and everything controlled transparently no one does that like in the transport industry as far as I can tell I mean there are companies putting some sensor in a box or that get their truck tested and they get a nice you know a thing in an A4 plastic folder in the the office of the manager which was printed two years ago sure that's not real real time to me it's just a dude who say yeah looks good now and it's tested let's see you next year Hans so that's kind of the the thing we we see and the other aspect around competitive advantage another aspect especially in the transport industry now it's it's very it's it's hard like if you say hey i'm gonna launch a big transportation company it's not easy you have to buy a bunch of trucks and you need to be profitable very early because you have like those huge transportation company that are like pushing you out of the market because they have very small margin but huge volume so the very interesting aspect about Ambrosius and especially the fact that we are trying to put an ecosystem and a community of people out there is that suddenly there will be someone who realizes that hey hold on actually that's a very very good tool and technology to repopulate areas and give work in places where almost no one has work because the main industry left so if you put it that way it's like the uber but you're putting the Uber model in a village where there's not so much going on other than agriculture, for example. Well, that's very interesting because now people who lost their job because the factory closed, they, I'm speaking like Trump actually, but that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized like, no, but the whole point here is, <laughs> The whole point here is that you can actually say, hey, those guys, they can earn a living by just taking some carrots, take, having a car and just like starting having a very decentralized transportation system. And that's a technology which allows you to make it very profitable, low cost to have this system in place. They can just start thinking, oh, okay, I can make like 100 bucks um, uh, every two, three days for going, taking my truck, taking a few vegetables. So there is no more need for having a huge truck that comes once a week to pick the whole goods. And um, you're mentioning the uh, sensors and so on. Like I uh, have I a, another question that. in mind. Sorry, like if I extend that a little bit now. <laughs> you want to um, see it? <laughs> what, ab what about the sensors being maintenance free? And the next thing is what happens with the sensor in my chocolate batch? Like, I mean, it's a production cost. It's mm -hmm. a trackable system. It's a, it's a product you, you ship on top on something. So sure. how is it recycled or returned? Or I mean, it's, it's, a, it's obviously a very good question. I mean, this we plan to have a few months of runaway for the battery. Then many companies out there, they're like just throwing them out. And many companies think, oh, it's only a few dozens or of dollars. I'm just going to buy many, put them. And after a few months, when they die, they're thrown away. So we talk with some companies and they just say, yeah, we just throw it away. I was like, really? I mean, that's electronics, that's batteries, like really? And the point is, you can just ship them back. We can redo the same work. And they're like quite tiny, right? So, I mean, one of the goal of those is 
to put them actually in, in boxes, in transportation pallets, right? I mean, now you look at most big companies. Uh, I know they want to see it. I, I mean, I've been reading the comments, so they're a very funny bunch out there. Um, so the the point is, you want we are looking at building those things in into the actual things that people are using in supply chain, like crates, boxes, pallets. That's quite a few things we're doing in the the R and D lab. How can we build that in? Of course, a pallet now is like a few euros or dozens of euros. And if you double the price, like why why would I buy a pallet that's twice the price? Well, because it's an investment you make, and that's adding a lot of the benefits later down the line, such as you can guarantee that everything you put on my pallets, they have temperature control. And if you look at the price companies like pharma companies are paying just to get that insurance from like very isolated boxes, this is a much cheaper investment in comparison, especially if you have a higher trust in the data that comes from those things. Hey, that's exactly why we're doing it. I mean, that's exactly the point. So if you can go to insurance and say, look, I'm buying those crates from this new startup. That new startup is just doing like transportation boxes that are not just in dumb plastic made in China very, very cheaply. They're actually much more expensive. Sure, they are twice the price, but this is something you hold longer because they are made in Germany by hand, by very good hand workers. And by putting those sensors on board, you get all that data and all the benefits. So we really encourage people to <laughs> We really encourage people to start thinking like that, to start thinking as ecosystem, to start thinking beyond just, oh, I'm going to put and it's going to increase your cost. Sure, but it's going to reduce a whole lot of other things out there. You can just say to the micro, it's faster. <laughs> so yeah, does that answer all those questions? I mean, that's the exciting part. We'll show it before the end again, if you want. Stefan is also, I think, no, uh, on Seeds and Chips. Uh, and we have an um, upcoming event in Milan uh, called Seeds and Chips. It's one of the largest food uh, expos in the world. And our CTO, Stefan Meyer, is, uh, uh, is presenting there. We're going to also have a booth. And there we will actually have the um, prototypes and demos of, the, of what's been cooking in our uh, sensor R&D. So that's also an interesting thing to look forward to. So any more questions? Then we have just like one, one, one last one, and just like from okay. So one was about: Will there be new partners in the near future? Of course, yes. That was an easier one to answer. That was the last question, by the way. <laughs> uh, there was another one beforehand. Yes, for like uh, for uh, for the community building. No, um, I don't have to read it. I know what the question was. The question was about uh, whether we're planning to engage with uh, or do anything in particular in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. That was the question that was before the last one, to my knowledge. Um, anyway, um, so right now we're focused a lot on Europe. And it's a lot of stuff to do in Europe as well. Uh, so um, we, are, we already have quite a few collaborations and projects that are very intercontinental in terms of their scope. And we do have uh, regular uh, discussions with companies based in the US or in China and elsewhere. Um, but it's important for us to also be realistic in terms of like what approach we take. So the core right now is in Europe. Uh, but we are talking with a number of companies uh, who are offering to be our partners in uh, large Asian economies, for example. And uh, as soon as we have um, something concrete uh, there to announce, we will announce it. Um, of course, important to, to note that we look at, there is a lot of trade element involved in what we do. And of course, we have to look at what are the large trading partners. And Asia is the largest trading partner for any other continent. So we are looking uh, very closely on Asia. And a lot of European companies we work with, their supply chains are heavily interconnected with Asia. So on that, uh, that's the answer to that question. And on Latin America and Africa, we haven't had that much yet. Uh, so if anybody from the community, and given that we've had some countries today, I saw Mozambique and Chad. Um, if they want to um, collaborate with us, we're always open for proposals. Importantly, also through our collaboration with the United Nations, uh, specifically with a 10 YFP, 10 year framework program, they do have a, a lot of uh, regional initiatives where they need local implementation partners in developing countries. And we are uh, collaborating with some, but frankly, uh, 
some of them are quite slow, some of them don't really know what they want to do. So we are, if anybody is, um, especially online, uh, who is based in uh, one of the countries uh, that work with uh, regional UN agencies for their development projects, we're always open for uh, discussions. And on our side, we do have quite a few contacts at the UN uh, whom we could bring to uh, launch projects specifically on development. Um, any other questions from the AMA, or we've gone through all of them from the public? Uh, people online, I don't know if you want to ask for uh, Chad, no electricity, okay. Uh, if anybody online has any uh, last minute questions that are, that can be answered in a serious event, uh, then you can pause them. And we can, uh, yeah, Vlad is now showing you the, um, the sensor. Um, yes. Yeah, that, that's um, Ireland event. Uh, who is asking about an Ireland event? It's actually going to be soon um, because one of our hubs is going to be in Ireland. So Ireland uh, can get excited. Uh, we will have an office in uh, in Dublin. Um, okay, so any serious questions? We have a lot of unserious stuff. Let's see. Uh, pe people can start getting their pizzas, of course. They don't have to necessarily stand for this, but uh, yay, Ireland, yes. Uh, so, oh, Mr. Bear Wolf is here again. He was. That's the guy from the, the, today's presentation, the one who was sitting uh, in front of a computer. So he's also gracing us with uh, his presence, never ever. But thanks for joining, nevertheless. Uh, I appreciate how dedicated you are. Um, Brazil meet. Uh, the, runway, the runway question, I think it's a fairly important question. So um, you also have to take into account that we do have uh, tokens remaining. So should that ever be a problem, that's an additional um, aspect for financing. So uh, from that perspective, that's for the next um, three years, that's uh, not a problem at all. So we do know it's a long-term project and uh, proper planning is made. How do we profit from ETH Zurich? Uh, benefit maybe is a more appropriate word here. Um, our um, solutions architect, Professor Roger Wattenhofer, he's uh, head of a distributed computing lab at ETH Zurich. And uh, specifically, I mean, besides obviously helping us with design of architecture, token economics and so on, he's also uh, helping us establish the right research collaborations with the university. And um, <clears throat> we are also looking into having maybe educational programs similar to BIOTS, where we participated earlier this year, uh, but maybe longer, longer term. Um. <laughs> Oh, Carrefour's blockchain project. I like to talk about that one. Um, Carrefour's blockchain project is um, basically, uh, how many of you uh, have heard about Carrefour's blockchain project? So almost none of you, right? Nobody in this room. So brief, brief, uh, brief story. So Carrefour have recently uh, published um, um, an, an, a press release that they've built their own blockchain that can do similar things, also an app with a scanner. All would be great if it were not for the fact that Carrefour built that blockchain and they maintain that blockchain, they're the only party that has that blockchain. So it's like an alcohol-free vodka, basically. You know, There is no point in that. Uh, it's just a database of which you have a few copies, but you own all of them yourself. So that's, that's what they did. And interestingly, um, interestingly, well, should be nice to them, but they also talk to us about how can we work with you guys? We say, well, you have your own blockchain, but something maybe doesn't work out that well. Uh, so when a company builds their own blockchain, it doesn't make sense. It makes sense maybe for only those parts where they want to just have their internal inventory management. But frankly speaking, why do you, you still have better solutions out there without the blockchain? So the point of blockchain is trust, is public element, is data integrity is transparency that you offer to people. And you must have a network that's maintained by the public in order to have that trust. So therefore, that's my comment on... Uh, they did for image, yeah, because right now people can eat that, you know, and like here I'm using it not in a literal sense. They can eat that, oh wow, it's checked on the blockchain, must be good, even though if, if you really think about it, it makes no sense over there. Um, but it's still good enough for marketing. But that's short term. 
soon enough it's gonna it's just gonna you know uh, nobody's gonna trust that okay well that's a lot of questions suddenly uh, you can just copy and repose these questions because there are too many and they just just get scroll down how will Ambroso solve blockchain scaling issues Anthony Oh, that's a lot to go into the <laughs> into details. I mean, the the type of data. I mean, yeah. first, the simple answer is that that's one of the reason we uh, we have a permission blockchain first because we want to make sure that all the companies you're using it have pretty much the full bandwidth for those kind of transactions when they are creating assets, when they are creating events. And by putting that in place, we can test, we can really have the time to improve all those things. Uh, also the type of data we want to store, and that's one of the topic, is how we create those bundles. Turns out that we can actually put quite a lot of uh, data about data, to put it that way, <laughs> on the blockchain itself. And that's very, very interesting because it turns out that if you're very smart in what data you're putting and when and how you synchronize that, you can have a lot of interesting scalability without, because you're not storing most of the data. How will Ambrosius verify that the data from its sensors are correct? So, I mean, the first question is, how uh, first, how do you get, the, the first question is how do you know that the sensor has measured the right thing? And that's one type of question. And this, we're really looking at how do you guarantee the physical integrity? For example, if you have a temperature sensor, you don't want people just putting ice on it to keep it cold. The second part of data from the sensor is if you have this guarantee that the sensor did read the right thing, how do you guarantee that it's transmitted? The second part is what we have explained with all the signing on the device and so on. So really the biggest challenge here is how do you guarantee that no one is physically messing around with the sensors? Um, what Oracle solution are you? Uh, yeah, we've heard about Chainlink. We, uh, we start looking a little bit more in detail in those things. So we keep obviously an eye at what people are doing. And I think we're definitely open to, to learning and working with those companies, uh, especially because we're a technology provider, um, not just a finally finished product. Uh, and what Oracle solution? I mean, we've been looking at that, and I think that was one of the questions that was asked online, either on Reddit or somewhere, um, or I think on Telegram. We're looking into that. We didn't spend that much time on the aspect. We want to make sure that the core functionality of Ambrosis is there. It's working and scaling. And once we have just the data management part up and running perfectly, then we'll be able to make more announcement and release other things beyond that core part. But uh, this is the most fundamental piece. If we can do the most basic job right, we're not good to be in business. So we have to do it. Um, so what's your working on? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, of course, we want to work on temper-proofing the actual physical device that no one opens it. How can you guarantee if someone messes physically with the sensor if they are trying to hack onto it? Uh, the simple way is to make sure that sensors only transmit data. That's a very simple answer. Um, that's one of the things. The other one is how do you guarantee that no one is opening the case using vibration sensor and so on. There are lots of things you can actually do uh, there and that's just an R in the area and there's so much to be done that uh, it's, it's really interesting. That's why we set up the whole lab in, in Yverdon so we can really explore those hard questions that very few people actually explored. Uh, it's, it's literally, there's not so much research on tamper-proofing physical things uh, in that space. I mean, there is, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's what we have for this one. That's that's just the basic thing is as soon as you open, then it technically stops working. So that's just a very basic thing. But there are lots of other things we can do. You can do with it. You can use like humidity, and I mean those are like weatherproof. So uh, that's one of the things. But a lot of other things to be done. And it's just like a whole new Pandora box, but a very exciting one. Okay, any more questions uh, from the public? No, everybody's enjoying their pizza already. From the um, online community, last, uh, last couple of questions before we wrap up. Non-supply chain dApps, 
it's a yes um, because we already have solutions that are not um, that are not necessarily supply chain or they're just one aspect of the supply chain. Uh, we actually, for the longer term, are looking into building the capability of having a blockchain and IoT, which is a, a broader thing. You know, it's, it allows you to have different um, use cases where at the intersection of sensor data and uh, and blockchain. So the question, the answer is yes. How many t-shirts? Um, yes. Um, Oh, n nice shirt, somebody says. Uh, I've, I've combined two questions. Um, yes, by the way, by the, way, the uh, Whoever here uh, is, um, is there anybody, well, since none of you know about Ambrosus, I don't think any of you are Amber holders. Uh, are you? Then you can claim three t-shirts if you want. Because you're the only one. But the rest can also have one t-shirt each if they want. You can give uh, to your friends the one that Vlad is wearing. That's made by our community. Uh, so uh, th that's um, so um, one of our community members here in, in Berlin will get uh, Vlad's uh, great T-shirt. It was entirely designed by our community. That's the that's the one aspect that I, I really enjoy is the fact you know how much creativity there is, and uh, we're uh, going to put even more emphasis on that. So do make sure to claim our your three T-shirts, and um, we also have these stickers. Um, so that's um, from uh, one of our community members. Any further questions from, uh, yeah, Domino's Pizza confirmed for delivery, yes, um, but not for a partnership. For Masternodes, um, stay tuned for Canada. It's, it's a, it's a multi-tiered approach we're taking, uh, but you'll have uh, a lot more details because Canada is going to be devoted specifically to the crypto economic model. And uh, importantly, AdCon is a very, uh, it's a developer-oriented conference, and there are a lot of uh, high-profile uh, Ethereum and other blockchain-based communities figures attending. So we're going to also have it as a peer reviewal process. So we will also get feedback and uh, inputs from some other team members to make sure that it's uh, done the right way. Um, and what's the expected time frame? I mean, that's a very legitimate and very important question. I think all the discussions we had like with direct trade and so on, I think this is a very interesting uh, opportunity because as you see more and more uh, impact of the overall blockchain technology in developing countries where you can now suddenly have a mobile bank, you can have basic services that people didn't have before, there will be more and more crypto empowered to put it that way and once they reach that stage then they can much more easily start using stuff like like Ambrosus to get their product to ship them to market without all those intermediaries and the other way around one of the projects we're working is how can we build software very simple tablet based software that we can literally subsidize and give out to farmers in developing countries and that's one of the things we really want to do soon give them tablets say hey this is for you it's for free it's paid by the community and you can now start tagging your product and by tagging your products they will automatically start to be sellable as high quality goods and that will make a lot of sense for those people because they get a little bit more of what they deserve at the end of the day from the products that we consume. So that's something, it's a very good question. Thanks for asking it. And I think uh, the answer is not just Ambrosius. The answer is like blockchain technology in general. That's a huge opportunity to- This to is um, a related question that's fairly interesting, but fairly political too. So becoming a quality protocol targeting countries that suffer economic embargoes due to product quality. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's an interesting question because I, I previously worked at, at the United Nations Trade and Investment Division and uh, specifically was working on uh, trade dispute resolution between Asian countries and the EU and the US. And um, this is the number one excuse that uh, developed countries have for not importing products from developing countries is saying that the quality is not good enough. Um, the problem is sometimes there, is, there are just no mechanisms to prove the quality or the cost of that will be so high that these people have no chance to import it or the tariffs are very high and so on. So from this perspective, um, this is one of those aspects that we hope 
We don't necessarily, we're not necessarily going to do it ourselves, but we're going to create tools that, because they're open source, people can use them in the way that they believe can benefit their countries or communities, just like with Bitcoin or uh, any other large blockchain projects, a lot of actors that are marginalized by the governments, the law or regulations or otherwise, they use it to go around it or, you know, whether for good reasons or for bad, that's another philosophical discussion. But uh, blockchain offers a way for people to uh, find another instrument that could help them avoid the oppression sometimes of the governments. So here, if we create tools and we make them open source and somebody is going to implement them to maybe help a country get out of the economic embargo, we are not necessarily, you know, it's, it's a theoretical discussion anyway, but the point is that if those tools help somebody, that's great. We open source stuff. So what people do with it is, is up to their creativity as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, so any further questions? Uh, blockchain agnostic protocols. Well, that's not, I mean, that's, we've yeah, answered that. Uh, just one question. So, um, one of the questions was interoperability between uh, blockchains. That's something we're looking at, and obviously Parity is very active in that topic, so we're following closely what they're up to. We are interested in that capability because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. There will be a new blockchain technology that will be much more fit for what we need. And that's why a lot of the work we're doing is not just on the blockchain layer, but on the technology around it, on the tooling around it. And all the tooling we build, we want to make sure when something new comes out that it will still keep working. Uh, and specifically to supply chain projects, now in theory there are standards that try to achieve that, that try to allow supply chains to integrate. I mean, the, the most known one is JS1, uh, EPCIS, and all the different standards they've been putting out there. So we're definitely looking into that. We're not going to try to reinvent a supply chain standard. What we want to do is to provide a very simple implementation that you can just take off the shelf without paying a lot of money to a big software company. Uh, to do it and we want to give out there this is open source you can start using it to track all your supply chain and share it with partners for a fraction of the cost that it takes you today so we're looking at those things and want to provide tools that make interoperability much easier in the supply chain space so about interoperability and, and transferring data from sensor systems into the blockchain yeah. so your research in that is, um, I read on your website, is in some EPFL innovation park. Um, why there? What's the value of that? And are you working with any specific company um, on that research? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you specifically about the research part. So the whole IoT space interoperability, that's an area where I've been working for more than 10 years now. So really, how do you create standards for the Internet of Things? And I actually wrote a book on that called The Web of Things. So that's really how you can leverage web technologies to connect with all sorts of devices. And the whole point was, hey, why can't I interact with all the electronics around me using REST API? because you can't you have like hundreds of protocols you have like Zigbee you have like Lutron you have like a whole ton of protocols and companies being building hardware and saying hey I have a, my protocol is better than yours so use mine and you see that every month that literally there's a new IoT consortium coming up and I'm like why are you trying to still solve a problem that way I and mean, there there are so many good things to be done around web technology there's so much you can do for interoperability Yet you see people coming up with something completely new, like, ah, the web sucks, I'm going to be not spending something specifically for device. I'm like, well, there's a lot of stuff that turns out you can do with web technologies. So just start with that, just start leveraging that stuff. And that's what we are trying to, that's why we focus a lot on building REST APIs first, because you don't need yet very specific new out of this world uh, technology. The only reason you need is that uh, most of the software in the supply chain industry is antique at best. Um, and you have to find a very old XML library. It's hard to find those nowadays, but you have to, to integrate with. I think the gentleman is locked.
Uh, for the second part, why EPFL? Why don't you want to say something for that? Yeah, uh, one more thing about the IoT consortiums. The problem with them is that mostly they are focused on a chip, like it's a vendor that has a chip and he wants to sell that, I, like, that they are now IoT. And they do some protocol around it, but nobody actually uses it because it's not interoperable. Like, you can, it can yeah, work with other stuff. Um, our approach is completely different. We start from the product and we go like from the product perspective to the chip and to the hardware. And I think that's a better approach because it's actually it will ensure that it will be used, and that's the idea. Okay. Well, last concluding con uh, con comment from me. Um, uh, EPFL in general, uh, as well as its sister university at Aha Zurich, uh, they're both one of the world's leading. Uh, research institutions um, and uh, they have uh, one of the largest number of successful startups that have been spun off um, and that's an important aspect there are a lot of universities uh, that are purely theoretical or their research is not that useful in terms of applica application that's uh, I mean I'm not going not going to discuss why and so on and so on but there are a lot of universities that produce research nobody uses ever and there are a lot of universities, uh, and, and there are, and they have Zurich and APFL, they're making sure that the research they make is, can be directly transferred into the innovation sector and into the real businesses. That's, and that's why, I mean, it's also, they're also one of the most famous and uh, most prestigious universities, but they've combined these two aspects, and that's what makes them, in my opinion, a very valuable institutions to collaborate with, and that's why we're also happy that we have, we started at EPFL, that's why we have a lot of things going on there. Stefan, as I mentioned earlier, he created the food uh, and nutrition center over there, so that's, of course, important for us to maintain those linkages, and with Etoha Zurich, it's also, it's uh, one of the world's prime areas for uh, research in engineering, and that's also important, because Ambrosius is not just a blockchain, it's blockchain and IoT. It's important for us to be very close to those clusters where you have availability of skills and research knowledge on those particular topics. So I think there's one last there's question. There's one more question there. Um. Given the scenario that there is a company out there who's like already tracking worldwide containers via satellite and so on, and they have all the sensors placed like heat and altitude and uh, speed and so on and so forth, so they're already tracking that, they already have their monitoring platform for that. So why should they open their collected data where the customers pay a lot of money for um, to bring it onto a public Blockchain. So, so how does that integrate with the business already existing? Because I see if there are containers, like whole containers or bulks tracked, then you have like a, a package with other trackable goods inside. So there's like a cluster and a wrap and it's complex. But why should that company, like, what would I tell them to, to, to open up their their mind and say, yeah, that's cool, let's, let's bring that onto a blockchain because it cuts off their revenue model, right? Because if the data is available. But if you put it the other way around, uh, the other way around essentially means, well, sure, you're competitive and you're making money, but what if other companies come here, start building and, and from the ground up sharing their data, they suddenly become more competitive, more and more interesting. So the answer is, People want that data, people want that transparency. They want, it's almost a right to have the data you're kind of, uh, that is around the stuff you're buying. I mean, I think it should be a right. If you buy a bag, you should have the right to know exactly what's in there. It's not yet the case, but soon, in a couple of years, who knows? And I think the point is companies who are not doing it, no, maybe not now, maybe not next two years, but in five, 10, 15 years, for sure, there will be like competition coming from the back who is going to be much more agile, much more innovative because they were designed from the ground up to have data shared. That's a competitive advantage first internally. I mean, I think, you know, what I see a lot when you talk to, to senior executives, like, hey guys, you should open up your data. And like, uh, okay, well, what's the use case? I'm like, well, I don't know because I cannot test anything. It takes me months to integrate your data. Okay, well, come back with a use case and then I'll open up my data. I'm like, well, if you open the data, I can find you hundreds of use cases. We can ask everyone to find use cases. So that's the conversation type 
you see a lot is is exactly this one. It's like, well, I need an incentive first. But when you start thinking that, hold on, the first fundamental barrier to innovation, especially when you're talking big companies, lots of data, complex processes, supply chain, and all of that, the single biggest barrier is that integrating data from a system to the other is so big that no one bothers, no one wants to pay the money for that. Because why would I integrate this with this? It's going to cost me like... 100 grand and next next week you come and ask me to integrate something else and uh, again i'll have to pay well think your system from the ground up that every piece of data potentially should be shareable but in a way that complies with gdpr compliance and that is secure that is trusted that is transparent once you have put that in place then that data and all the data flowing from every corner in your company is going to be your operating system as a business. And that's going to make you a lot more fast, a lot more competitive, a lot more suited for the challenges in the year ahead. Simple. Simple in theory. Uh, <laughs> less simple to put in practice. But those are the barriers. So you, you just look at APIs of, of most of the software companies use. Like, they don't exist. That's as simple as that. Okay, well, thanks very much. Unless anybody has any last questions, we're going to wrap up here. So thank you very much for coming and staying so long. And uh, thanks uh, a lot to our online community who have been following us and posting all these questions and comments. Uh, feel free to share your feedback, invite us to other cities, or otherwise you know, propose anything uh, through our Reddit or through any other channels. And uh, thanks very much for being with us. And have a good day, night, or whatever time of the day it is on your site. Bye. Thanks for keeping it free. Thank you.